Well, good morning. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you right now, you can turn to the book of Micah, right near the end of the Old Testament. Uh, Micah chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. And as you turn there, uh, I'm going to share a little bit of a story with you. And the story goes like this. Stories of a little girl who comes home after church uh, during the Christmas time. And she comes home, and when they get home, they sit down at the table, and uh, the little girl says, Mommy, 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 I, uh, I drew for you a picture today in Sunday school, a picture of the Christmas story. Mom says, oh, that's great. Uh, why don't you show it to me? So the little girl gets her picture. She brings it over to her mom, and mom looks at it, and you can tell she's a little bit confused. And so with great wisdom, she asks, um, why don't you explain this picture to me? And so the little girl says, well, mommy, that's uh, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. And she says, oh, okay. It looks like they're on a plane, though. And the little girl says, well, yes, mommy. They're on their flight to Egypt. <laughs> oh. And, and who is this that, that's flying the plane? She says, Oh, well, Mommy, you know, that's Pontius Pilate. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. And, and who is this other kind of large-looking man that seems to be on the plane as well? Says, oh, Mom, that's round yon virgin. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. And, 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 and the baby Jesus, um, what is the baby Jesus on? Oh, Mommy, she, uh, baby Jesus is, sleep, is sleeping on heavenly peas. <laughs> the mom got a very unexpected um, explanation of the details of the Christmas story. I think for many of us, um, sometimes things aren't quite as we expect. For many of us, we seem to and we think that we know the Christmas story extremely well. We think that we know all the details. But I feel that so often we miss out on some of the very unexpected details of what the Christmas story really brings. Some of um, the details maybe we mix up or we get confused like our very young aspiring artist. But God works in unexpected ways. And when we fail to slow down and really look at the Christmas story, we miss out on some of the most unexpected and beautiful parts of the Christmas story. Some of those details, I believe, come to us in the book of Micah, in this prophecy that's found in chapter 5. And so I want to start by reading there, and we're just going to read the first verse to start. And as we dig into this prophecy, the first verse is just going to, it's going to give us a little bit of context so we understand what Micah is talking about and in the time where he is at. So this is what it says in Micah chapter 5, verse 1. It says, marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. This prophecy that Micah is bringing, Micah prophesied during a very troubling time. And the background to this prophecy is a time uh, when Israel is being attacked, where it is being beat down by its oppressor, who is known as the Assyrian army. The Assyrians are really this powerhouse that exists within this time that are wiping out everyone else, that are seeking basically to, to conquer, to build an empire. And Israel was being humiliated by this Assyrian army. The likelihood that um, the Assyrian army would overwhelm them was very possible. And this humiliation is depicted in the treatment of their king. In verse 1, it says about striking on the cheek. The Assyrians are essentially insulting the Israelites, insulting their king and their weakness. But it wasn't just a time of external trouble and danger. Internally, things for the Israelites were not good as well during this time. Corruption abounded, justice was preferred, and judgment very much loomed. And when trouble and sorrow come, I think we can all agree that it's very difficult. We can see that within our own lives personally, and it was very much no different for the Israelites, for the people 
that are hearing this prophecy. At such times, we often have all sorts of doubts about God, about his love for us, about the future, about the whole purpose of our life. And the ancient people of God were no different. They felt these same pains and these same struggles. So maybe for you this morning, you find yourself in a place of great distress. Maybe an Assyrian army of sorts is bearing down upon you. And if that's the case, I urge you to listen closely as we dig into the rest of this prophecy, to look at the promise that God gave to the Israelites in their time of oppression, in their time of struggle. What the ancient people were told was absolutely remarkable. It's about the birth of Jesus. It's about the true meaning of Christmas, something that changes everything in a very unexpected way. So let's continue to read Micah chapter five. We'll go to verse two through five. But you, Bethlehem, Euphrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she is in labor and bears a son. The rest of his brothers and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace. When the Assyrians invade our land and march through the fortresses, we will rise against them, seven shepherds and eight commanders. Here we find a great promise, and the promise is where we're going to start. Verse 2 tells us that a ruler is going to come out of Bethlehem. Now, the unexpected part of this prophecy is not that a ruler would come, but that the ruler would be coming out of Bethlehem. To help us understand that, I want us to, to kind of play a little bit of a game together. So you're going to have to participate with me. Oh, I just came to listen. Um, participation is key. So what I'm going to do, I'm, just, I'm, going to say, I'm going to say one word, and I want you to say the word that comes to your mind when I say that word. So it's just a one word thing. Say it out loud, and uh, we'll see what we get, all right? So, so volume is key, too. So if I say hot, you say Africa, okay. If I say up, you say? Nice. If I say Mickey, you say? Not bad. Santa? All right, pretty good. So for the most part, pretty, pretty similar answers, except for Africa, but we'll give it to you. Um, if the Israelites were to play this game, if they were to do the word association, and uh, they were given the word Bethlehem, things that they would associate, first off would probably be that this was the town of David, who was also a shepherd, who was a king. But then apart from that, it might get a little bit different. See, Bethlehem was known as a place and the words associated with it might start to become weak, small, insignificant. After all, Bethlehem, nothing much ever happened there. Jerusalem was the center of attention. Jerusalem was the place where important things happened. This is the place people would look to and notice and expect things to happen or to come from. Why not choose a place like that, these people must have been thinking. Why not choose Jerusalem? Why not choose a place where people would actually notice, where people would actually see Why choose a place like Bethlehem, a place that the world may be considered insignificant? If change was to come out of Bethlehem, would any change really happen at all? Would anyone even see the change? How was the world supposed to see a promised ruler when the event of his coming was taking place in this lowly town of Bethlehem? For one simple reason, so that God would be magnified not man. God chooses something small, something quiet, something out of the way, and does something there that changes the whole course of history 
and eternity. God's plan was to use Bethlehem. Its standing did not affect it being used by God. Why? Because God welcomes the humble. Because in doing so, no man can boast, but the greatness of God will be seen. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 31. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Let, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. The birth of this promised ruler being born in Bethlehem spoke the truth that God welcomes the humble. It reminded the people that salvation would not come through our own power, but rather through God and his promised son. John Piper sums up this point like this. He says, God chose a stable so no innkeeper could boast. He chose the comfort of my inn. God chose a manger so that no woodworker could boast. Oh, he chose the craftsmanship of my bed. He chose Bethlehem so no one could boast. The greatness of our city constrained the divine choice. And he chose you and me freely and unconditionally to stop the mouth of all human boasting. The deepest meaning of the littlest and insignificance of Bethlehem is that God does not bestow the blessings of the Messiah, the blessings of salvation on the basis of our greatness and our merit. He does not elect cities or people because of the promises or grandeur or distinction. When he chooses, he chooses freely in order to magnify the glory of his own mercy, not the glory of our distinctions. So let us say with the angels, glory to God in the highest. Not glory to us. We get the joy, but God gets the glory. The only way we enter into the kingdom of God is if we humble ourselves like a child. Some of us have never laid hold of that, that truth that is so prominent here at Christmas of humbling ourselves, coming before God and saying, I need help. I can't do it on my own. I need a savior. For those of us that are already Christ followers, we have maybe lost our way and started buying into our own press. We try to earn favor with God. We've forgotten that it is a gift of God. His grace is what saves us. Human greatness, human religiosity, these things merit nothing. Grace is found in Christ alone. God was asking of the Israelites what is often so hard for many of us to do, to trust, to trust in his plan and his purpose. One of the most difficult aspects of trusting in the promises comes in verse three, when Micah tells the Israelites and lets them know that they will need to wait. There will be a period of waiting before this promised deliverer comes. And so Micah there has there, he has a call to faith. Micah lets the Israelites know in verse 3 that there will be hard times. He explains it in terms of there will be labor pains. There will be hardship. Deliverance would come in the form of a promised ruler, but they would have to wait. God was giving a promise to his people that would require that they have hope and faith in the time that they waited for this promise to arrive. Too many, of a, too many of us, it might seem as though God was asking something that was impossible. He was asking them to endure hard times that would come 
And trust me, hard times would come as the Assyrians continued to push down and bear down on the Israelites. He was saying, be patient. He was saying, hold on just a little bit longer. This was definitely not what a hurting and tired people wanted to hear. Many of the people who heard Micah did not like that message of delayed salvation. Just as it is hard for many of us to often hear that we are going to have to wait. In verse 5 and 6, we read the response that the Israelites had to Micah's message. And it's a response that speaks to the fact that Israel sought to fight, fight their own battles. They sought to create alliances and bring people with them in which they could fight against the Assyrians. They didn't want to wait. They said, I can do it on my own. We'll take matters into our own hands. And so they became marked by a confidence in man rather than a confidence within God. Now, it's easy for us to look back and say, well, they should have just trusted God. Why didn't they just trust? Why did they trust in their own abilities, try to fix things on their own? But let me ask you, (laughs) how many times do we find ourselves having the same response in our life? To take things on, on our own. To not wait patiently for the promises of God to come to fruition. To work on our own strength and our own merit to try to see things happen when our health is failing, when we are in broken relationships, when we encounter death. For many of us, when right now, maybe in times of financial difficulty, within job loss, other stresses and trials that come our way. Do we trust that God will deliver us Or do we rush to try to fix it on our own? Do questions of uncertainty, love, and pain push us to hold on to God's promises? Or do they push us to let go? I get it that trusting in God's promises is not always easy, especially when it involves waiting. An article I read this week put it this way. God is asking the unthinkable to trust him in the dark, to accept his will when we just don't understand, to submit to his sovereignty in the midst of uncertainty, to believe he has a purpose when nothing else makes sense. Unthinkable as it is, God keeps asking me to trust him. The invitation is not what I want. (laughs) I want to understand. I want to see. I want to agree. Accepting God's invitation takes faith, which I possess in great measure when I'm not in the furnace. But that faith wavers when the flames envelop me and my dreams fall apart. The Israelites were no doubt in the fire. And yet God was asking them to hold on, to trust, to trust that deliverance was indeed going to come, that he would provide a promised ruler. The focus was on waiting in hope and faith for the time that God would send that promised ruler. The people of Israel often failed to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with their God. But the really great news of this prophecy of Christmas is that God still sent Jesus anyway, even when we failed on our end. You see, although the Israelites failed to wait on God and tried to do things on their own strength, God did not void his promise to send a ruler. 
And this shows the unexpected character of who Jesus is. When we fail to trust as the Israelites did, we can remain confident in God's promises because of who God is. So, this promised ruler, who is he? The promised ruler is described then in verses four and five. We are told that he will be our shepherd, that he will be our protector, that he will bring peace. It's important for us to know that this peace is available to all of us within our own lives, but beyond that, I truly believe that Christ is speaking of peace that will transcend and extend throughout the world. Christ came to give peace in our lives individually, but ultimately he came to restore peace to the whole world. Yes, God wants to be that ruler in our personal lives, and he should be. God needs to be the ruler within our own lives. But Micah is writing of a ruler that will restore peace to the world, to our whole earth. This promised king, it says, will rule in the strength of Jehovah, in the name of the Lord his God, for his glory. He will be perfectly obedient. His reign will be an ideal expression of God's will. He will therefore provide security, stability, and peace for God's people. He attains this by eventually giving up his own life for his sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd is the one who ultimately lays down his life. His reign will stand firm against all changes, against all trials, against all challenges, anything that will come. It will be constant, reliable, and permanent, and will extend over the whole earth. God truly is indeed our good shepherd. And when you hear that, you might think and kind of pause and say, look at our world today. I don't see that. As John prayed, he brought many things to our attention and things in our world that are not right. Places where there is not peace. We look at things like ISIS, the Syrian refugees, the attacks in Paris, people who feel that suicide is a good way, bullying, a battle of marriage equality and rights. There are many things within our world today that speak very much against that God is bringing peace. It's very easy for us to look and think that that is not the case. If God promised peace, I don't see it. So let me take this time to then remind you that just as the Israelites had to wait for their fulfillment of God's promise, so too must we. Christ has come. We see that in the promise of Jesus, that promised ruler coming from Bethlehem. And we ourselves are fortunate to read of the event actually happening and incur- occurring and experiencing then the goodness of Christ within our lives. But just as this perfect ruler entered into the world, so did sin and destruction. As such, a battle rages on between light and darkness. And so we are left with two kingdoms that today battle against each other. But the truth is the battle is not yet over. It continues today and Christ does promise victory. So we find ourselves waiting for this second coming of Christ which will fully restore grace and peace and which he will gather his sheep. God is working to uh, reclaim and restore a world that has been so greatly affected by sin. And as God's creation, we now live in the middle of tension, a tension between God's kingdom and sin. And because of this will, um, because 
we will continue, continually experience things in life that separate us from what God has planned. But remember that God still brings about his promises despite our brokenness. Just as God still fulfilled his promise to the Israelites of sending a promised ruler in the midst of their sin, God is faithful to us and he will restore peace to our world. Let me assure you and let this text assure you that God will bring that peace. To help us see that further, I want to read to you from the book of Revelation this morning. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its, ta- its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the very moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, and the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, all you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down beyond. He is filling with fury, because he knows that his time is short. This, prophecy, this, this passage in Revelation echoes the prophecy that a coming ruler would come, a ruler that would bring peace that would bring an end to destruction. It echoes the battle between good and evil. The passage shows us that God is sovereign. But the key verse to me is verse 11 because it says that they have overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We can have hope and we can rest in peace because God has overcome this world. Read in in Revelation chapter 16 today as well. It talks about who Christ is when he comes back in his power and his strength, how he restores peace. We can rest in peace because of that fact. He has overcome Satan. In this, we can have hope that God will, um, will bring peace and that he will be our shepherd, that he is working to restore that peace and it will come to fruition. So let me close with this. It seems to me that when God says that Jesus is the promised ruler, he means this. Jesus is the one that I've sent to bring peace. Christ has done this in many ways already. In sending his promised ruler, God was able to trample death under his foot. When Christ our ruler died upon that cross, Because of his obedience, peace is being restored in our world, even though we see so much brokenness. God is still pushing against that. Christ is not done with restoring our world. When we choose 
to follow him, we join him in bringing peace. Our obedience to God and to his call helps to restore that peace. Will we fail at times? Yeah. The people of Israel often failed as well. But the really great news, as we said earlier, is that God still sent Jesus anyways. At the heart of Christmas is a celebration of the faithfulness of God to do all that he has promised to do. At the heart of Christmas is our belief of Jesus that he was coming as this promised ruler. So therefore, let us proclaim glory to God in the highest and peace on earth towards all. We do have a great ruler in Christ, one who is our peace and our good shepherd. May we trust in him and may we wait eagerly for the day in which his promises will be brought to their fullness. Will you pray with me? God, we come before you this morning and <laughs> we thank you for the promised ruler in which you sent. the ruler in which you sent in such an unexpected way. (laughs) But God, in that unexpectedness, we get to see so much more of who you are, of your character, and of your glory. We are reminded of the fact that you have a plan, that you have a purpose, that you are seeking to restore peace to this earth. God, we are reminded of the fact that we cannot do that on our own, even in our deepest desire but Lord, that it comes through you first and foremost. God, may we humble ourselves before you today. When we're trying to do it on our own strength, in our own way, for those of us that have walked away from you or never even chosen to step towards you, God, would we humble ourselves? Would we cry out and say, Lord, I need you. I need a savior. May we take hold of the promise of the promised ruler in which you have sent. And as we go forward, may we partner with you in restoring peace to this world. We pray these things in your name. Amen.